Talking about Phoenix, and what I usually do is I plug the company that pays me to work on Phoenix full time so I can do this without burning out and just building bandsaws forever. So uh, I gotta give a shout out to Fly.io. If you haven't heard of them, uh, you probably have more recently because Heroku just decided to stop being good. But that was like 10 years ago. But anyway, what Fly does is it's like the perfect platform to launch your Elixir and Phoenix applications. It's a Heroku-like experience where you can deploy apps but they cluster them together with a private IPv6 network, and then you can span regions. So you can deploy an Elixir cluster all across the world. It connects and discovers itself, and you have this private network that just works without you having to do any of that. So it's a perfect place to launch Elixir apps. It works really well for LiveView because you can serve apps close to users. So it's kind of like if you took the CDN idea, like we all kind of know that like we put our JavaScripts and CSS uh, stuff on CDNs because we want to serve those assets close to users, and we do that because we can load uh, websites more quickly. So all of us kind of understand that intuitively, but then we never think about like, what if we could just run our entire application there instead of just serving our assets? So that's what Fly does for us. Anything that can run in a Docker container, which is anything, you can run around the world. Uh, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, US East Coast, West Coast, we have like, 30 regions um, that just serve basically every continent. So you can do that and serve your app close to users. Uh, and then like stuff falls away, like there is no CDN anymore because your app is the CDN. So like unless you're serving um, like videos, plug that static becomes your CDN. So there's a ton of cool stuff you can do. So definitely check us out. Uh, show of hands, anyone deploying on fly? Awesome. Keep your hands up. I'm gonna get a picture and then it makes me look good for the fly team. Look at that. Awesome. So yeah, definitely check us out. If you have questions afterwards uh, about Fly, just come see me. So Phoenix 1.7, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about LiveView 018. Don't need to go through these. Phoenix Verified Routes. Uh, this is an amazing feature that came about because Jason Stibbs on the Phoenix team complained for like the 12th time over the last eight years at the right time when I was ready to hear the feedback. And then uh, Jose happened to have a, a really fantastic idea how to address uh, the shortcoming. So we have a Phoenix uh, route helpers that you probably are all familiar with. We, several years ago, re-aliased that to routes. Um, they kind of suck, and I always thought they were just okay, but they're very verbose. So Jason has been complaining basically since the beginning of time, and I've always been like, yeah, but you need to pass the connection, or you need to pass the socket, or your endpoint, because we don't have global stuff. You could have multiple routers. And finally, we were like, no, this actually sucks. And Jose was like, what if we just did this? And, and that became Phoenix Verified Routes. Because the issue is, like, normal basic Phoenix routers, like, it's not e intuitive to figure out what the route helpers are. And we have to ask, like, why are route helpers a thing in the first place? And it's because you want to be able to programmatically rebuild these arbitrary route paths in your router. So they exist for a good reason, you need, so because if you change the route, then you don't want to have arbitrary 404s in the future, depending on the code path the user took. So we added them for a good reason, but they are not very intuitive. We inflect them by default. It's like one of the couple areas in the framework where we inflect things, and we get it wrong. So this is a real app from one of the applications I built recently, and uh, if I took a poll of the audience to what route helper this would generate, most folks probably would get this wrong. Because uh, we snake case the plug or controller, so it's like O underscore auth callback path. And uh, you know, that's not hard to figure out because the compiler's going to complain, so you fix it. But the thing that made me realize that verified routes absolutely should replace route helpers is when I put this slide together, I left off the new action, that new atom, and I didn't realize it until I was rehearsing. So like, as a framework creator who made this pattern, implemented it, in the framework and has been a user of it for almost nine years now. I got this wrong my first try. Just, just writing normal helpers. I forgot the action goes there. So there's definitely something wrong here. It's verbose and not discoverable. You have to like get it wrong first. 
And it's the same thing for like as things nest. You have to kind of like know the framework conventions. You can kind of guess what, what happens here. Like we generate off of nested namespaces. I think I just lost video, which is fantastic. So you've got to know that you need to pass the show atom and that the names are like nested and then they, they build a nested function. And then you have to know that it builds a variable argument function and you can pass like the post and comment data structure in the order they would appear as dynamic segments like post ID slash comments ID. Not that hard. But when it comes to live routes, I get this wrong. Like actually, if you ask me what helpers are generated, even though I've rehearsed this already and I wrote this, I will get this wrong. I don't, you know, I don't, I have no idea. Because live routes have like what we generate for you. It's like you on the show page or the edit page, or yeah, on the show page, you can actually click an edit button and it opens a modal on top of the show page. So there's like an edit within show. So the helpers are like route user show path, and then you have to repeat the show atom. But then if it's the edit of the show, you pass edit there. And it's just nonsensical. So we can do better. So what this becomes is you just sprinkle strings everywhere in your application, right? Um, except it doesn't suck. So verified routes are a sigil-based um, string. And what we do at compile time is we will actually dispatch that string against your router and give you a warning if we didn't find anything that matches. So instead of all this arbitrary routes passing arguments, you just write a string with a sigil p. Same for this. You know it's post slash id slash comma id. You just write that. So I can say sigil p posts. I interpolate, just like string interpolation. And it's way nicer. Uh, but it's even nicer than that. Because in the case of LiveView, like, like those functions are so verbose and complex, but the path is just user slash ID, right? Like it's such a simple path. Why do we add this indirection? Because we can just say slash user slash user, like, and we're done, right? There's no more thought. So it's super nice and it's protocol aware. So instead of having to like sprinkle IDs around or change code everywhere, just like the route helpers, you can interpolate a data structure and it uses the same Phoenix param protocol. So I can just say slash post, interpolate a post, and if I want to slugify URLs, I just go implement that in one place for the protocol. So like having used this, it's undoubtedly the, the, the way to go, and we'll, we'll see some examples. And it's aware of query strings. So like route helpers to do query strings, they took an optional argument on the end. And for us, no, you just write the string, right? If you want to add a literal query string, you just do question mark page, you interpolate the value. In the compiler, at compile time, we see the question mark, we know a query string starts there, so we can encode the query string properly as it should be, or you can give us a dictionary and then we encode that uh, a map or a keyword list as a query string param. And you use this everywhere, tests, live views, regular uh, dead views, templates, and it solves like this age old question of like two camps saying, in your test, do you hard code paths or do you use route helpers? And some folks said use helpers because it makes your test less brittle. Some folks said, well, there's this explicit contract with all your web clients Maybe you have external clients that you want to know if you change your route that things actually break. Now, like, you just don't think about that. You just use sigil p, and you're going to get warnings uh, when you change the route. So super nice. Just do this everywhere. And you get warnings from the computer when you do things wrong, right? That's what you want. So if I add something that doesn't exist, I get a standard Elixir warning file line that I got this wrong. If you're using Elixir language server in your editor, you get inline a squiggly that says, hey, you got something wrong here. And huge quality of life improvement. So speaking of the computer telling us when we're wrong, and no, this isn't going to turn into a types discussion, but it's nice when the computer can tell you when you're obviously wrong. We have declarative signs and slots on top of LiveView that give you some compile time niceties that I think really give us kind of like this next level of the component ecosystem that we can build up around LiveView. I think this was like the missing piece to really have like, there's a, like the pedal framework, if you're familiar with that. I think we can see a vibrant ecosystem pop up around LiveView and components because of these features. And I have to give a huge shout out for, to Marlis, the Surface creator, for spearheading these ideas, uh, helping with the initial implementation, and as well as Connor Lay, who has helped with adding slots and some of our documentation generation. Uh, so these two folks made this happen. So. Huge thank you. Yep. So this is what this looks like. It's a regular function component where you write sigil h heeks. You can write your documentation like general, but you annotate these things with macros. 
and you can say, I accept a row ID, and we have this idea of global attributes as well, which we'll see uh, in, in a moment. And you can accept slots, and slots are like a way to have a component accept arbitrary markup or other uh, component calls. So instead of just passing like strings all around, you may want to say, well, in my table, I actually want to put arbitrary content in there, and that's what a slot is. And you can say exactly what this component accepts, whereas LiveView 017, it had to be embedded in whatever documentation you happened to write, and you found out at runtime that you were wrong. So huge quality of life improvement, and we can build up tooling around this. So when you run mixed docs, uh, this is work that Connor Lay did, it will actually just take that information and put it right in your documentation within the documentation you all, that you wrote yourself. So it says these are the attributes that this table component accepts, and these are the slots. You can document the uh, attributes and slots in line as well, so you can build up this kind of rich documentation, and then now it's like discoverable, and the computer tells you when you're wrong which is a huge quality of life improvement if you use function components at all. So um, after having had this, and I have to thank Marlis for spearheading this, like I can't imagine doing the function, com function component route and not having this because it's such a quality of life uh, improvement when you're developing day to day. And we added this idea of uh, defaults and global assigns because what we had before, and you can still do this today, but you often had to rebind the assigns variable if you wanted to do defaults or do any kind of computed value. And that's still valid today, but it's basically an edge case because we can do a lot of this um, for you. And then you notice this assigned attributes call. That's what you had to use if you wanted to say, well, I want the caller to be able to pass arbitrary attributes like uh, area labels for accessibility. They want to add their own PHX click or their own data uh, values to a container. You used to have to this, add this for both function base, basically everywhere. But now you can just say, I accept these attributes. Um, the name is required. So at, run, or at compile time, it's going to tell you you messed up. And then this global attribute is basically any attribute that's not declared here that is also a valid HTML attribute we support. So I can just say attribute rest, whatever I want to call it. It's global. And that's anything the caller passed that wasn't name or outlined and also exists in the set of, I think, 100 or so HTML uh, attributes that are known. And you can default there. So here's where I can give a default class to something and have it applied plus anything else the caller wanted to pass. And I use this everywhere. Speaking of quality of life improvements and the computer doing stuff for you, there's a uh, Heeks formatter for HTML that I didn't have to write. Uh, Felipe was kind enough to just go off and do this. Um, not asked for, I, I wasn't necessarily sold on formatters at the time. And having used it, I can't imagine not having it. So huge thank you to Felipe for, for taking this on. It's a super complex body of work because you're not only formatting markup, you're formatting arbitrary elixir code within markup, but also arbitrary elixir code within tags within markup. Like, there was a lot to handle there, and um, he did a fantastic job. And he, here it is working. And I actually, <laughs> yeah, thank you, Felipe. Uh, the hilarious thing is, uh, I don't like taking videos or anything. I like to show it, like show it live. So I almost deleted this slide like 20 minutes ago. Well, an hour ago at this point. Um, and I was just going to open up VS Code and show it, but that would have just that would have ruined things, right? So what this does is, if you it's a mixed format or plugin. So if you have format on save or you run format uh, yourself, it's just going to format all of your code, including all sigil H's in the app. So it's not like just template files. It'll format your template files, but it's any sigil H in the app. And it will, it's aware of like um, code inside the like, class. Like I have a modal here with like a JS command. If that spanned multiple lines, it would actually break that out and properly indent it within the function component tag. It's amazing. I can't imagine not having, not having this because anytime you copy paste markup around, you have to like indent everything and then you have to indent your Elixir code within that. Now you just let the formatter do it. So let the computer do work for you when it can. Uh, we added live uh, generation to the authentication system. So this was like a, something I thought would be a like medium-sized uh, level of work. And I have to thank uh, Berenice on the Phoenix team. Um, she's on the Phoenix core team. She, she asked, like, hey, what's a good next thing to work on? And I was like, oh, you know, we have this. I think this would be a good one. And it was like a ton of work. I think like 80 files changed. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Berenice, for sticking this out. Uh, it turns out like it's... If you run with the live flag, it looks almost the same as our other authentication system, but everything is a live view. And the reason why it took a lot of work and why it's important for me to have live view in the mix, not only because I'm biased because I think everything should be a live view, it's that especially around your authentication and registration system, you want that to be a rich experience, right? You want to be, when someone's registering for your app, you want to be giving them feedback 
about the input that they're typing. So it was important for me to have registration and user settings be a live view, but we generate a bunch of templates for you, and then we also generate code for you that's well tested, that tests everything that we generated. So not only did Berenice have to like, go convert everything to live view, she then had to write well tested code against the code that we generate. Uh, that way you can take it and move it forward. So I think the tests for it alone, I think are gonna be a great learning tool for people. Uh, but for me, I think in collectively, everyone that runs the authentication generator and then manually has to convert everything to live view, it's gonna be a huge time save. So thank you, Berenice. Yep. And now the contentious part of my talk, uh, Tailwind. So Phoenix 1.7 will include Tailwind by default. Uh, there's no like dash dash Tailwind flag, you just get Tailwind. Um, this is probably gonna make some people upset, but it will actually be less work if you don't like Tailwind to remove, and we'll talk about that. And if you listen to Adam, the creator of Tailwind, uh, he'll tell you like himself that like, I'm gonna try to give you the pitch of Tailwind if you're not familiar, or if you've been biased by people telling you it's terrible that you have to suppress the urge to retch long enough to give it a, ch a chance, and then he thinks that you'll never, you'll wonder how you never work with it uh, any other way. So uh, this is true, like for me, I, I, I didn't necessarily think that strongly about it. I was just like, I don't really understand, like I don't really understand it, like seems okay, but uh, I had to actually try it to, to have it really resonate. Uh, but I think the, the biggest thing that uh, I've internalized since using it and that what he says here is best practices don't actually work and I'm not really a uh, CSS expert. Like I like to tell people my, my CSS knowledge is like mid 2000s passable. Like I, I ran my own company in like 2003 uh, and that's where I derived all my CSS knowledge and like everything was like, if, if it didn't work, I added a float left to it. And if that didn't work, I added a clear both. And like if that didn't work, then like who, who knew what you had to do? But like that's where I was coming from, um, coming into Tailwind. But like I, I like to, I told Adam this, and I hope I, I told him. I hope it didn't offend him. But I told him like that is actually a selling point for me. I can treat Tailwind like uh, with mid pass, like passable, barely CSS knowledge of mid two thousands. But I actually get to use like Flexbox. Everything works amazingly. The sizing system makes everything like just work like you would want it to. Uh, with me not knowing about Flexbox or how any of this stuff works, uh, so I think that that's a testament to like how powerful it is. And that doesn't even touch on some of the benefits. Because for me, historically, uh, working at consultancies or working on my own stuff, it's just CSS becomes almost a uh, technical debt burden immediately. And you have to like, think about like, okay, I'm gonna define this button here, right? So I define some CSS, looks, it looks pretty, but then someone comes along later and says like, well, I wanna add a large button. And it may even be yourself, but you almost immediately end up with global state, tightly global state, tightly coupled global state in your CSS files. And if you're using SAS or nested CSS selectors, you have almost no intuition on what changing something somewhere will do to the UI of the app. So you end up, in my experience, with CSS blow out of the box because someone comes along and they either change the font size to create their custom customization they want and then they break an app that QA finds later, or you wanna be careful, so you're like, well, I'm gonna add a large button class, and then someone, another developer comes later and says like, well, I don't know if your large button class does what I want, so I'm gonna add a utility class called text large, and I'm gonna extend this uh, BTN class. And like, so you end up with like three classes to show a button in the app, and this continues for the lifetime of the product. CSS becomes a nightmare, it's unmaintainable, and this has been my experience historically. And this is a problem, so there have been multiple patterns and paradigms that have developed to, to address it. So lots of folks will adopt some of these, like object-oriented CNS, or uh, BEM is really popular, separating CSS into blocks, elements, and modifiers. So there's an entire body of work around addressing those issues and solving them. And these things have you know, great usage in the wild, but you have to be an expert. And the problem is, what Adam alludes to is, the moment you have a developer on the team, like me that comes in, you're like, I just wanna add some padding here. They're gonna, the moment they touch a CSS file and, you don't have, and they're not part of that team of experts, the house of cards falls down. So for me, the thing I love about Tailwind is what LiveView did to HTTP, Tailwind does to CSS, where you said like, you have all these patterns that someone could learn or the team could adopt and hopefully adopt correctly and hopefully adopt for the lifetime of the product, but then you have to do like naming, like what do I name these classes? That is a mental burden that you do over and over. Then you wanna like, well, I wanna structure things because I'm a developer, so I'm gonna add different CSS files, but then that CSS is gonna become large, so I, I add code splitting because that's like supposed to be what I do, but then I have to like configure Webpack or whatever it is. And this is a lot, right? 
and this isn't just about decisions. This is just like configuring tooling and just getting stuff working just so someone can add like a customized CSS thing somewhere. And then you have to go learn these patterns. You maybe use SAS or less, which is another, more build tool stuff. But it's the same thing as what Livey did for HTTP. Instead of naming controllers or templates, instead of having to then write client code that has like models that wire up to contracts that I write on my server, and then I have to implement serializers, I have to name those things. And then maybe I use GraphQL because I want to optimize it, or I use JSON API. If I want to do like any kind of push updates from the server, I do some like ad hoc web socket stuff. The thing I love about Tailwind is like it does what Livey did. We're just like, no, like we, we have transcended HTTP. We don't think about it day to day. Same with CSS. Like, I don't write CSS anymore. I never touch a CSS file. And that sounds terrible, but, but hear me out. Because I want to show you something beautiful. Look at this button. Beautiful, right? Blue, it expands, it's, it's, it, it's, it's responsive. And like, look at these classes, right? This, this is beautiful. And this, this is about the point where people, like, they see Tailwind, and this is where they're like, no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this can't be like, like this is where like you have this divide where people are like, I don't understand. Like this is what I'm looking at day to day. Like how is this, how does this compose? Um, but I think the missing piece is Tailwind is perfectly suited for a component system. So like whether that's back to view, live view function components, it composes with a function, cons or a function component system perfectly to where you're not writing class soup everywhere. Right? You are writing class soup, but it's not throughout your application. Everywhere you have a button isn't this copy-pasted list of, of classes everywhere. It's something like this. And this is the beautiful part, where I have one thing in my app that defines a button, and that thing is self-defined. And if I want to customize it, I can do that with Tailwind Utility Classes. So as we'll see with my uh, component generators that Phoenix uh, is adding for you, it's not about not writing Tailwind classes, although our generators generate classless uh, stuff because we want people to be able to, to use Balma or Bootstrap if they don't like Tailwind. But the idea is you have a self-described component, and then if folks want to customize it, like I want to move a button over a little bit, as uh, most developers do, instead of going and hacking a CSS file somewhere, I can just extend that thing. And I define it in one place. So while this is class soup, I have a function in my app that defines a button defines all the markup, any logic around that button, it gets documented in my code base through mix docs, and it's self-defined here. The styling for it is in line, right? And while this is a lot of classes, this is what it takes to generate a styled button in your app if you want it to be responsive, if you want to, ha to have focus states. There's a Phoenix submit loading class that Phoenix adds for live view. If you want it to animate or go slightly a passive to give the user feedback, you have to add that here. So there's a lot here, but this is, necessarily everything that is required to show a button in our app to work at different breakpoints, and it's defined in one place. So I like to say that there is class soup, but in your application, it will be defined exactly where you expect it. There isn't anywhere to look. I didn't have to go come up with naming schemes. I literally defined it in line, and anytime I, I'm gonna see, I, mean, I have to try to see if I can actually do this, I'll do it in a little bit, because I, I, don't, I don't know how this computer works. So. I'm gonna go to the Tailwind website. Actually, I'll do it now. So the cool thing is with uh, Tailwind, again, I, I don't know how like Flexbox works or anything. So like my ten, my day-to-day -day development as like a non-designer or CSS pro is like when I don't know how to do something, uh, just in general in CSS or Tailwind, I'll be like, I'll go to the Tailwind website, I hit Command K, and I'm like, I just want to add like something like spacing or a gap, and it's like, oh, that looks promising, and then I'm like, oh, there's like a gap thing, and this is like Flexbox related, right? Like I didn't even know this was a, was a Flexbox thing, but like Tailwind almost like teaches me things that exist in, in the CSS spec for like years, right? And then Tailwind's gonna give me exactly how to use it, examples, and then I can copy and paste this into my app. The formatter is gonna make it pretty, and then I can continue going forward. And I just do this and somehow develop like well-defined responsive applications, the Tailwind um, compiler actually generates the minimal CSS required. So like, it's almost like I said, the, the worse is better approach. Um, you can treat it like mid 2000 CSS, Chris, with writing bloated CSS, except you're gonna get the optimal thing on the outside. And I, I can come, come to this five years later, and if I wanna customize a button, I just edit this class list. And this is what you end up writing day to day here. So before you're like, well, the class soup is still too much for me. 
what you write day to day in your UI once you define these core set of components is something like this. And this is actually what the Phoenix Gen HTML and Phoenix Gen Live generators generate for you is a header component, a simple form component, an input component, a modal component, and that function defines all the tailwind classes, but what you're consuming day to day at yourself and your team is something that looks like this. Highly composable and reusable, and the beautiful thing is our generators with milligram before this generated a ton of markup with minimal classes, but classes here and there, and they weren't reusable. The moment you wanted to use Bootstrap or even Tailwind or Balma, the generators became essentially useless to you. But now the generators will be, they continue to add value because I could just go implement header, simple form, and modal in my app, and I imagine the community will end up doing this. Uh, we'll generate, out of the box, you'll get a components EX file with your base level components that you see here, plus a couple others. And then if someone wants to do Balma or Bootstrap, they'll just implement those functions for you. And you just add those functions in your app instead of the Tailwind ones. And hey, all the generators work with Balma or Bootstrap and it looks beautiful and works without you touching any of the code. So this is like the big insight around Tailwind is you're not doing class soup everywhere, you're having well-defined components. And the thing with Tailwind that I also internalize is the same way that LiveView um, borrowed React's idea of co-locating markup and your app code tightly together because those things are tightly coupled. Like any state that I add here, the template needs to know about and vice versa or the program doesn't work. So like React added JSX, which is HTML in your JavaScript and a lot of people hated it, but that was the big revelation where like these tightly coupled things necessarily live together. Like they can't live apart. And the moment I need to add something to a template like a chain set or this first visit Boolean flag, it's right there, right? It isn't like, okay, now I have to go actually go find the file it exists in. Maybe it's in some kind of like render hierarchy they're tightly coupled, they exist together, so we should put them together. And that's what Tailwind does, right? You don't have some like parent selector that's applying some global class in certain contexts. Like Tailwind is utility classes defined inline, so that thing is self-described. It isn't some global state being applied. And a big thing I'm focusing on Live View 018 is accessibility. Because one thing I've learned is developers don't care about accessibility, or if they do care, the project manager or the product owner or the client says, ah, it's not really important, so it doesn't get done. So even if you care deeply about it, you don't have the time or resources to do it. So what we've done is we've shipped a couple primitives to at least help generate accessible uh, experiences out of the box, because I think Live View shouldn't just be like a good way to build applications, like we should be good web citizens and build the best applications we can that serve everybody, not most people, right? So if you're like a, uh, let's say a vision impaired user using a screen reader, there's a lot of, a lot of things on the web just don't work for you or work well. Uh, and one is like focus wrapping. So like the code we used to generate or currently in Phoenix uh, stable is uh, a modal pops up, but then if you tab through that modal and you tab after the last uh, thing in the, in the modal element, you're left uh, in the page somewhere. And as a screen reader user, the modal's still showing, but now they tab and they're outside the modal and the, the screen reader is telling them about other page information. But the fact that the modal is still there and showing, it's not obvious. So there's something we can do. We can do focus wrapping. And there's a function component that you get ships out of the box with LiveU018 where you just say focus wrap, you give it an inner block and it gets focus wrapped. Uh, so it's pretty nice, and our generators generate that out of the box for you. So even if you don't care or you don't have time to care, what you get out of the box for a modal will be focus wrapped. And we have other uh, focus niceties, uh, like there's JavaScript uh, JS commands for pushing focus to kind of store where you came from and popping focus later to say, okay, restore focus at a certain point. And there's a focus first function that says, like, just focus the first reasonable thing in a container because developers are lazy, and if they had to programmatically say everywhere in my app that I do something now, think about having to focus because it's helpful to uh, accessibility users, they're not gonna do it. So out of the box, our show modal and hide modal functions that we generate for you will just focus properly. And focus first will work probably for the vast majority of use cases. It finds the first thing in there that's like a non-hidden input or a button, anything that it can actually focus, it will put focus into. And let's see a demo of that. And this is where I uh, would have shown code, but I think we can still show uh, what we built here. Cool. Yeah, so I, I spoiled this, uh, but if you peeked at this earlier, but this is actually designed by the Tailwind team. So a, a big thing 
that happened recently was I reached out to the Tailwind folks and said like, hey, we want to uh, change the Phoenix generators to use Tailwind. And they uh, were actually kind enough to design and implement the core set of components for us. So this is a landing page of Welcome to Phoenix when you run Phoenix New. Uh, they designed it, spent a lot of time on it, and in the same way that, you know, the, the landing page is basically like, hey, Phoenix worked on your machine, and we want to make it pretty so you have a kind of a, a good first impression, but it's a throwaway page today, um, and it still is going to be a throwaway page, but with, what we worked with with the Tailwind team is they kind of wanted to teach Tailwind as well, so it's not just like, oh, it looks pretty, they actually kind of want to show you kind of what Tailwind can do, so there's like some cool a animation hover states, like they, they want to show that like Tailwind isn't just like a bootstrap where like you just copy paste code from Tailwind UI and never touch it again, like you can build basically fully custom design interfaces with it and, and do whatever you need and, and they're responsive. So like out of the box, like this page here kind of shows you um, internally, if we look at the code, how to do different breakpoints where things are going to span. And it's just a, a pretty starting point with kind of a custom design uh, sidebar. But the more interesting part is our CRUD generators like Phoenix Gen Live, Phoenix Gen HTML will have um, fully designed components here if it loads. Really? OK, so the mistake I made was actually closing my laptop. <laughs> but I can get this up real quick, because this is, this is the coolest part of the talk. I may have to change the URL, though. Let's see if it, let's see if it reconnects. I may have timed out the tunnel. Oh, it says it's reconnecting. Hold on. I think it'll work. It's just got to, maybe. I can reestablish the tunnel, and then I have to type in this absurd UUID, which would probably be faster. We'll fix all this in post, right? All right. This is like multiple UUIDs, so I'm going to type this in. Wow, all right, so. Yeah, so no one, uh, no one go here. <laughs> I guess they can, but don't, uh, don't in input any data. <laughs> I have a perfect track record of doing publicly accessible live demos, and no one's done anything terrible yet, so don't break the streak. Ta-da! All right. So look at this beautiful listening here. Um, but no, so it's, you know, there's only so much we can do design-wise and out of the box for you to make this look like a, a, a complete application. But these are defined components in your app out of the box. And this is, this is a table example. We saw an example of like the header component in your app. So we see listing posts here. It's fully styled. You can add actions to it uh, at the caller site. And then you have like nice hover states here if it shows up on the, with contrast, looks like it does. Uh, but the cool thing is, out of the box, it's not just like, okay, cool, a table. You, you actually have like fully styled elements. So if I click Edit Post here, I get a beautiful modal. This is using JS Command's client side. It's using animations, so like the hide modal uh, function in your app and the uh, show modal function in your app are using um, Tailwind-based classes that animate the element for you. If this actually is going to work, it's still up and running. Oh, oh, you also saw the, the error? So, it, hold on, I, that's, that, it, it spoiled it. Um, I don't know if it showed it, there was a little flash message that showed up and I wanted to show that as a perfect example of, uh, of slots. But the cool thing is there's, uh, there's uh, focus ring state here, so we can see like a, a nice border. If I type in and have a validation error, I'm gonna get can't be blank. So Tailwind, like I said, the designers actually designed these things for us. 
it's basic out of the box, but it gives you this nice out of the box experience to prototype your app and at least show you how you would do these things. And again, it's all defined in one function. So if you don't like the way this modal works, you just go change that. And the really nice thing is if we see this open again. So I click edit post. The first thing that got focused was this input, right? Like this doesn't seem that amazing, but like we didn't do this before. And a lot of apps or developers don't even think about doing this, right? So you're immediately, even as a non screen reader user, you want to, you don't want to have to actually click or tab yourself. So that's nice, but we also do focus wrapping. So if I start tabbing here, I get to the end, it wraps focus around, it's exactly what you want. But like, but we do this out of the box. And again, I, I've worked on accessibility, adding accessibility to applications, and it just doesn't happen, uh, even if folks care about it. So out of the box, you get it, and hopefully keep it. And I, my hope is with the primitives that Live 18 adds, that things like the pedal framework and other UI libraries that spring up around this are accessible out of the box. And if you notice, when I hit escape, it actually put focus back on the edit post button. So again, we have primitives to actually restore focus back from where the user came. Because if you're a screen, re screen reader user, you will have tabbed through the application. You get to edit post. You're like, yeah, that's what I want to do. You click it. It comes up. But out of the box, browsers don't have an idea of like go back to where you came. So if they change their mind and they hit escape, they would just be focused randomly or wherever the browser happened to restore focus, maybe document body, and they'd have to like retab back to where they were. We put it back for you. And this is what we do out of the box. So even if you don't watch this talk or don't care about it again, we're at least going to serve those users and serve them well. And I want to show one more thing. If I can, you, oh, this is Firefox. So let's see how we use this. We want to do the web inspectors. Bam, nailed it. All right. Um, if I disconnect this live sockets, I immediately get the slash notice, like not that fancy, but I want to show how that's implemented. If we reconnect it, so the goal, like we should be giving the user feedback when stuff goes wrong, right? We show that loading bar, loading bar out of the box, which is nice. But here we can have a component that's just going to show the user feedback. Let's see if we connect. We're running over. There it goes, maybe. OK, so I'm running through, tethering through my phone. This is on conference Wi-Fi, but it took a while, but it worked. And if we see the code that actually made that happen, we generate this uh, connection function component in your app. We don't have syntax highlighting, but we can use our imagination. Oh, wait, we did, just not heeks. Cool, cool. All right, so we have, let's see, command T, does it work? No, def connection. Really? There it is. So the cool thing about this uh, little connection thing that showed up is in our live layouts, to enable this, we have a connection function component. And within that, there's different slots. So if you wanted to give the user feedback for what happens when you lose connection, what happens if you're, if you're loading for the first time, you've dead rendered, but you're waiting to connect to the server, we could add, uh, there's a slot that says uh, loading. So if I wanted to give the user feedback why we're loading, I could do that. But in this case, I just say, when you lose connection, I want to report to the user that something bad has happened. And here, this is any arbitrary content I want. And this is kind of like the nice composability. Like out of the box, we give you a flash component that's implemented in your app using Tailwind by default. So this function component connection can just add this slot, and I can put my own flash in there, or I can put some other toast, whatever I want to show, or if I just wanted to show like at the top of a nav bar, right? This is usable wherever I want in my app, and it took like three lines of code to do. So back in my components module out of the box, I'm going to get a connection function component. It has three slots, disconnected, uh, connected, and loading. And the cool thing here is all it does is just call render slot of what the user passed. And instead of having logic on the client that says, like, socket on error, go add a class to some container, uh, we add Phoenix variants for you. So if you're familiar with LiveView, Phoenix LiveView adds Phoenix connected, Phoenix error, and Phoenix loading classes to the LiveView container. And pre-Tailwind, you would go to your app CSS somewhere, and you would add some specific uh, scope CSS selector around a connection status or whatever class you wanted to handle this show hide case. But what we do for you out of the box is we add in your Tailwind config, 
which you don't even really need to know about, will have variants around all these Phoenix LiveView classes. So instead of having to go to CSS and go down this nested selected, nested selected rabbit hole, you can just prefix your Tailwind utilities with these different um, CSS classes that Phoenix has, and then just inline have the logic for showing and hiding, right? So what we do is Tailwind has a hidden class, right? So your, your disconnected thing is hidden by default, and until a Phoenix error class is applied, it's just going to stay hidden. But then if it is applied, we add the block class, right? So if you're not familiar with Tailwind, block is like display block, right? So we're just like overriding hidden anytime that there's a Phoenix error, and then that shows the thing. So this is all that it takes to drive that dynamic, oops, we're trying to reconnect, and then as soon as the connection comes, it hides, and you get that out of the box in a few lines of code. So this is like kind of a neat way that, like the more and more I use Tailwind, like the less is I just have to do, and this is a really, really cool example of that. Let's see if I can show some other examples of what we have. Yeah, we don't have time. <laughs> but out of the box, you get enough to do tables, headers. There's a, a nav here. Um, the authentication generators are also fully designed. I haven't implemented them yet, but like your sign-in page for Phoenix Gen Auth will be custom designed by the Tailwind team using the, the existing primitives of the app. But everything out of the box, whether it's authentication system or like basic CRUD, is actually going to feel like a, a fully developed application. and it will be accessible. So after this, uh, uh, Storybook has been on the Phoenix roadmap for a long time. It's basically a web interface of all the components in your app, and it allows you to see visually what they are. So it's almost like documentation on steroids, and you can, uh, even in some of these uh, solutions from the JavaScript ecosystem, you can like type in and see what attributes are accepted and what happens visually as you change your component and diff with different arguments. So this is on our roadmap to work on as soon as we got done with LiveView 018 and Phoenix 1.7, but uh, Christian has actually gone off and built the whole thing. Uh, so check out the Phoenix Live storybook. Um, we're actually going to add his initial work to a uh, official LiveView uh, storybook um, repository. So he just joined the Phoenix uh, Slack uh, basically right before this conference. So as soon as I get home, we'll start working on a, a live view storybook solution uh, based on his work. But if you want to see it now and it's, it's valuable and usable, go check it out and uh, give him some feedback. I want to add streams for basically PHX update per pin and a pin, but in a way that it doesn't suck. Uh, if you use those today for a way to like push updates for an infinite list, uh, it works, but it's kludgy. You can't do ordering. So if, this idea of streaming data to a container will allow you to do like ordering on the client so you can add things at a specific place. Uh, you can append or prepend programmatically instead of having to do like the hacks of changing a attribute on a, on a container. So a lot of that work has been started, but I had to shelve it to get the rest of this done. Um, Mickey talked about live view, live component messaging being like weird because it's not unified. So we want to have a unified uh, live view, live component messaging API because uh, the problem today is if you render a live component from a live view and you want to message the parent, uh, you have to know who your parent is. Like, did it, a parent, was a my parent a live component? Was my parent a live view? And it changes what you call. So there's a unified API there. We just have to put it together. Um, complex forms really suck. Uh, we've known that for a long time. Uh, I have some ideas. It's been on my list. Uh, but that's my probably next big thing to work on. If you've done any kind of like choose your own adventure form thing where like based on previous form selections, you re dynamically render other parts of a form. Uh, doesn't work well with the Phoenix HTML form data protocol, doesn't work well with ecto change sets uh, because when we wrote them originally, it was like you add the form data to the form struct and then you throw it away and now it's stateful. So it was never written in a way that used basically stateful uh, actions being applied back to the data structure. So if we had to, basically we're gonna treat it as if we were implementing forms from scratch uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, if you have a complex app today where forms really suck, I'd love to talk to you because uh, the biggest help would be a real world use case where we could say like, I work best if I'm like, yeah, that really sucks. How can I make it better? Versus kind of trying to intuit uh, a form API. And then uh, function components in template files. Uh, folks really have asked for this. Uh, co-locating in your code for me is still my preference, but as you get giant uh, templates, or like layout files that are huge, you, you want to put those in files, and that's understandable. So we'll probably support a bodyless function clause because it's like valid elixir. So you could say like def layout, and then in a layout.geeks file, add your layout. And so you'll be able to do declarative 
uh, assigns on a bodyless function and then implement the template in a file. Um, and, and along those lines, I think layouts are going away as far as like uh, Phoenix View layout is like the only touch point you have at this point with uh, regular views. So like most folks, like they don't, if they're using Live View, they don't touch views ever, um, especially once we add function, uh, so especially once we add template files for function components. So I think if you think about what a function component is uh, with an inner, with an inner, um, inner block of content, it's just a uh, function that takes a inner slot. So like a layout just becomes literally a def layout, a bunch of markups surrounding a render slot inner block. And that, that, that's a layout. Like we can remove a, a concept entirely by just having a function component. So that's coming. Uh, we have to solve some primitives there first, but um, I don't think it'll be soon after Phoenix 1.7 that we'll, we'll have um, actual layouts implemented uh, in function components. Well, thanks for bearing with me with the technical difficulties. Um, we probably don't have time for questions, but I am here um, for a while, so please come up later. If people do want to ask questions, I'd be happy to stand up here and answer them, but I know we're, we're way over, so I'll, I'll, I will yield to, to Amos on whether we, we do Q&A. But thank you.